Welcome to the fourth season of The Coaching Cast, your working from home club. Here to keep you company, remind you that you're not alone and that there's many of us outside of your current four walls, all trying to survive and thrive in today's business environment. So regardless of where you are working right now or whatever you do as a career, we've got something for you here at The Coaching Cast. I'm Lisa, founder of Grip Corporate Coaching, personal performance coach, leader and chief eye roller when it comes to all nonsensical corporate mumbo jumbo which suffocates rather than advocates. And I'm Susie, sales and business coach at Future You Business Coaching, currently taking on my hardest coaching assignment to date, parenting that two-year-old who doesn't take too kindly to being questioned. In this podcast we explore all things work-related, matters impacting you at work right now, presenting different topics each episode, which we discuss with some special guests along the way, sharing ideas, hints, and tips for you to take away and try for yourself. We hope you enjoy listening. Today, we're continuing our discussions on the topic of leading inclusively and specifically about building a diverse team. So stay with us and enjoy. So before we get into this topic around diversity, Suze, tell me about your week. How are you? Hello, I am um, good, thank you. Yeah, You're still with us. You haven't been swept away. (laughs) Still here, still um, in the hub of the coaching cast. Um, it hasn't been blown away by the crazy, crazy weather that um, I think everybody has endured over the last week, apart from yourself. <laughs> apart from me, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't pretend to have endured awful weather. I am in Cape Town. Well, I'm not actually in Cape Town right this second. I am in South Africa and the weather here is glorious. Uh, so, yes, I have been watching oh. the news and talking to all of you guys about how awful the weather is in the UK. It's like one storm after the other. Can't keep it's- up has been absolutely crazy (laughs) i feel like i have been in the wizard of oz literally um storm after storm after storm i think i've got them here so there's storm dudley storm eunice storm franklin and today we've got storm well here where i am we've got storm gladys there's four you're on storm four we're on four storms it honestly it's crazy um so it really went wild on Friday which was um storm Eunice I think from memory um and the wind was crazily strong like so I've never experienced anything quite like it lost a roof tile off my new extension God so, damn it. one annoying secondly glad that it didn't smash my car or anybody's head around so really thankful that that was like not okay the thing um but now I've got to get that fixed so this house is like whack-a-mole I've started calling it I sort one thing out and then something else pops up <laughs> sort that out and something else pops up and I'm just like oh, ah. God, what a nightmare um so yeah honestly it was crazy and then I drove um across the um like what, what is it Derbyshire Dales I'm not sure what kind of hill it is that I drove over. Anyway, there's a hill, quite a few big hills from um, Manchester towards uh, like Leeds, like Sheffield Way. There's like a yeah. big hill range. And I drove Peak over there. Peak District. Peak District. Is that the Peak District? <laughs> I don't know if it is actually. <laughs> I don't know. It's more I went to. That. I went to the I stayed in Sheffield for a Hindu about 12 years ago. And I remember being told we were right near the Peak District. We were, well, I lived in Sheffield. I went to uni in Sheffield, so I really oh, should yeah. know. I really should you know. You should know this. Anyway, this hill range, um, which I was going to see my lovely friend Julie, and I drove in my electric car over the hill, and honestly, the wind was insane. It was like, I felt like we were just kind of like moving in this car, like forwards and backwards. The rain was like pummeling down. There was so much spray. And also there was floods on the road. So I was one of these kind of sort of cheeky drivers where I would like pause and put my hands on. People would go around me and I'd be like, I'm just going to watch, see if they get through before I <laughs> mark. Because like my husband is going to kill me if I were in this car. Like, <laughs> um, so I managed to thankfully um, get there and back on Sunday, but it was wild. 
crazy, crazy. And also I've talked before about my range anxiety in my new electric car. Oh, that was off the scale on Sunday (laughs) because the traffic was really bad. So I ended up having to turn things off to minimize what was being, the electric was being used for so that I had enough range to get home. Um, So it was freezing because I turned the heating off. Um, I'd minimize something else as well. So it was just, yeah, not a particularly like comfortable experience in terms of being in the car. It was freezing cold. The rain was pelting down. Um, and I was a bit like, oh no, but I had a really nice day. It was really good. And it was lovely to see my friend. So it was worth survived. it. I survived. But yeah, honestly, crazy wind. Absolutely insane. Um, and that's about it really in terms of this week. But my mug is still going <clears throat> strong there it is I feel like a loose woman I've got my own mug I feel like I should be there at half 12 on ITV chatting all sorts of daytime (laughs) chat um brilliant I'm glad our mug's still surviving survived the dishwasher survived the dishwasher guys if anybody's after a coaching cast mug we have got merch as we mentioned last week um still tbc on the quality of the merch but it survived one week so i'd take that yeah yeah for sure high quality it looks good looks good (laughs) maybe just hand wash your mugs if you're unsure (laughs) how are you anyway yeah i'm good so um we're very tripping at the moment so we spent four nights last week in the wilderness sort of north northwestern cape at the top of the cedarberg mountain range which was amazing and did lots of hiking so i've been laughing about this for a couple of days now because i don't think in the uk we call it hikes we just call it a walk and i don't know why like the americans the australians south africans they're all obsessed with hiking love it's 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 a walk all i will say is that because of the landscape the terrain that exists in those three countries I think they have a lot more variety around, you know, mountains, hills, ravines, things like that. Whereas in the UK, I mean, yeah, we have mountains, you know, we've got like Snowdonia and like the Brecon Beacons and like, you know, you get mountains, but like I live in the Cotswolds, you get rolling hills there. I wouldn't say you're like scaling up and down. We've got that bit in between Manchester and Sheffield, which we don't know what it's called. I can't remember the name of, but I think it's the peaks. But you know what I mean? It's UK is generally flattish I would say in the majority of parts and we're just going to get a tirade of abuse now or like comments on our socials going that's factually incorrect but anyway that's my interpretation and you don't really get wilderness in the UK because it's a really small country you can't really go too far before you bump into someone or a house in in somewhere like South Africa where it's so vast you just you have a lot of open space and so to stay in an area and being able to actually hike which is what I did for the first time I feel really smug about it it was amazing um so we on the I think it was our second to last day we did the sorry I've got a bug flying around in front of my screen that's why I'm doing this I'm like grabbing at the air I think we've got mosquitoes actually my husband's been bitten this morning um yeah so I digress we decided to go with their advanced hike And this is quite unlike me because I'm not adventurous and I worry about hurting myself. I worry about falling over. But I was like really up for this. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I was thinking no high end resort is going to put people in danger, are they? They're going to like make it pretty safe. Anyway, we, we set out on this hike. It was three hours long and it was scaling up and down like these like mountainsides and cliffs and going down ravines. Or oh. without any sort of like equipment. Anyway, I really enjoyed it. It was really good. And we did it. So I felt very smug coming back and being able to enjoy a beer um, and be met with the like the celebrations of the staff and other guests who seemed to be in awe of us. But I would just add to that the general age of the guests staying at this place was like 65, 70. So, you know, compared to what they were capable of doing. Yeah. I, I suppose it was quite an achievement. Anyway, we checked out and they handed us a certificate. I've got a certificate. I'm super chuffed with it. It's got a wax seal and everything. Oh, my God. Can you put it so, on our Instagram? Because I think... Yeah, I'll put honestly, it on the Instagram. I put it on my personal Instagram page, but I'll share it on the coaching. Yeah. But I'm very proud of it. Also, like, you should I don't be. Think I'll, I don't think I'll ever get over... Um, 
you know, I still feel like the kid at school who's like getting some sort of external recognition and in a physical format, you know, I've got something I can keep to she loves a certificate. mark my Chalisa. Yeah, I, I'm very pleased with this certificate. Yeah. Well, so, so you should yeah, be. That I'm sounds stoked. amazing. Well done, you. It was amazing. God, that's my worst nightmare. I on anyone who knows <laughs> me, and I and we've done a little behind the scenes feature, haven't we, on our Instagram this week? And if yeah, anyone I saw yours that, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Mine says I hate walking down slopes like on hills. Yes, I read that yesterday. <laughs> so this is actually my worst nightmare. I would hate it. I'd have a panic. You would attack. have hated it. Yeah, you would have yeah. hated it because it wasn't. I wouldn't have said it was a slope. It it was literally like working your way down on rocks, like trying to find the step. Like you know, what can you? It was, it was like rock climbing without the ropes and the gadgets because it, it wasn't it wasn't as advanced. As I it, but you wouldn't have liked it. Would have been crying. I would have been crying. My legs. What happens is my legs go to jelly, and so then I can't oh, rely right. on my legs yeah. to help me yeah. because my anxiety about falling. It's it's to do with falling gets like over yeah. the top. So fair play to you. You deserve that certificate. Well done. Thanks very much. I'll do you think you're the it. only people who at that hotel who's ever completed it? That's why you got a certificate. No, I don't think so. <laughs> it can't be. It can't be. We can't be the only ones. Jeez, that'd be really funny. But it, it definitely was a hike of theirs that I don't think had been done for a while because the way it. that they mark the trail is ba- is through like little piles of rocks, which is it's quite funny. Like you're on a mountainous region where it's all sandstone. So the shapes of the rocks are fascinating because the way the water and wind has eroded. But what is marking your path are little piles of rocks. Well, there are little piles of bloody rocks everywhere. So you do have to kind of do have to kind of get it's not a foolproof like method, I don't think. But yeah, it hadn't been done for a while. Definitely some animals have shifted some of those rocks and plants oh, have grown over them. Nice. And but it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was good. Oh, it good for good. you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So should we get cracking with our discussion today around building diverse teams? Let's go. Cool. In the last season of the coaching cast, we spoke about inclusive leadership and its importance for effective, engaged and happy workplaces, which we wanted to continue exploring in this fourth season. Being an inclusive leader involves encouraging and supporting diversity, individuals' differences, which can be vast and varied, their perspective, their culture, their ethnicity, their gender, their experience, their socioeconomic background and their skill sets. The list goes on. Moira Alexander, contributing writer for CIO Online, says, with diversity comes multiple perspectives. When team members bring a variety of backgrounds, cultures and experiences, they are more likely to solve problems and be innovative. This can lead to more thoroughly vetted results. Leaders are also more likely to be able to make better decisions based on facts. Building a diverse team requires thought, consideration and planning, but the benefits can be substantial. Moira goes on to share that 76% of job seekers say a diverse and inclusive workforce is essential when evaluating companies and job offers. Developing a culture that encourages D&I creates a sense of belonging for everyone. Harvard Business Review reports that having a high sense of belonging can increase job performance by 56% or more, reduce turnover by 50%, and significantly decrease the number of six days. So how do you build a diverse team? Let's discuss it. So Susie, from your perspective, what are the first steps in building a diverse team? So I think this is a great question to kind of kickstart our conversation today around um, building a diverse team, because in my experience of this kind of subject, and also from some of the training work I've done, I definitely think there are um, steps in getting to that point where you look at your team and think, okay, what is the setup here? And actually, how can I make this more diverse to bring benefits to the way that we perform and the way we problem solve, the way we communicate, etc. So I think the first step really is acknowledging and understanding 
the importance of having a diverse team. Um, and that's looking for me really at the current situation of your team. So if you are currently listening to this and you manage a team of people, and that doesn't have to be a large team of people, that can be literally one person, or it can be uh, a team of five, a team of 50, et cetera. It's important to have a look at what the current setup is of that team. So ask yourself some questions. So for example, is that team um, all men? Is that team all women? Is that team all white? So there's lots of different kind of questions that you can ask yourself in terms of just getting a bit of a understanding of what the um, dynamics are in your team and the current um, kind of structure. And holding up that mirror to what that setup is, I think is a really crucial first step. And you can broaden that as well in terms of if you've had um, your personality profiling done, you can look at, okay, what is the setup of this team? Are there uh, lots of people who have certain um, preferences or characteristics? Are they very driven? Are they very detail orientated and very outgoing? So you can kind of ask yourselves lots of different questions to kind of come to a conclusion and hold what the setup is of your current team. And then once I think you've done that, you kind of then need to kind of self-analyze what does that tell you? So what are some of the strengths that sit then within that current team? And also this will help you in terms of building a team moving forward as well. And also what some of the um, areas are for improvement and what then the opportunity is. So as an example, if you've got a team where um, it's all predominantly um, men, so I did when I was managing a big team, my direct report was, uh, direct reports were predominantly all male. Uh, I had one female in that team, didn't I, Lisa? You did, it was me. <laughs> it was Lisa. <laughs> um, so we, um, you know, when I kind of looked at that kind of shape of the team um, and holding the mirror up to that, it immediately kind of sparked me that I needed um, a more kind of diverse representation. So I was very kind of clear that I wanted to bring a female into that team to bring a different dynamic, which it, it definitely did. Um, and so looking at where those kind of opportunities then lie in terms of how you kind of build those next steps, you subsequently build that next, that kind of plan for creating more diversity in your team. So really, I suppose, yeah, holding that mirror up and then overlaying any feedback from the team itself. So whether you do like surveys, so lots of big, big businesses do kind of engagement surveys. Um, I'm not sure whether smaller businesses do, but they're a great idea if you are a smaller business or you're, you work for a smaller business that can still do this, is just asking some questions on a regular basis to your team to get an idea of engagement. And there'll be some feedback that comes back. Uh, and then taking that feedback and overlaying it in terms of your um, kind of analysis of where you think the team is at and, and what some of the strengths are and what some of the opportunity areas are for themselves. Um, and that kind of is how you make people also feel listened to. And that's really important. I think we're gonna come on to talk about this in, in a minute in the episode around belonging, because I think that plays mm. a crucial part in terms of building a diverse team actually. So we'll kind of come on to that in a sec, but um, how, kind of ensuring that people feel listened to by um, acknowledging their feedback, overlaying that against your kind of, um, I suppose, assessment of where you think the team is at, how it's made up, what the structure of it is, what the opportunities are and, and, and the subsequent um, kind of areas for improvement can be really, really critical in your first steps, in my experience. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Lisa? I think it's that always remaining curious about everybody in equal measure, because I think if you are already working to understand individuals and therefore identify the differences and appreciate, acknowledge them. I think that's a really great place as well to start because I think what you always have to be careful of with any of these sort of topics is that you're not making assumptions or judgments and that you're not being biased. And I think we have talked, uh, we touched upon like unconscious bias in one of the previous seasons. It is a really difficult area because I think we will all carry an element of bias at all times. And 
I think it's being aware of that rather than trying to completely stop it or quash it in its entirety because I personally think that's impossible but I think always being aware of it is really important and therefore you, then you can manage it and you mm. can do things differently you can correct yourself so I think if you always stay curious and seek to understand the people around you whether that's those that you directly manage or your peers that way you're always basing all your understanding and your your awareness of people on facts and things that you've gained not judgments you've made so I think that's really important and I think the more that you do that you role model it and you encourage others to do it the more you are supporting the building of a psychologically safe space which I think is essential for encouraging diversity and that sort of plays into that point you just made around belonging um because I think people start to grow a sense of belonging and connection to their environment when they feel safe to be able to do so I mean you're never going to feel like you belong somewhere if you feel unsafe in it because you're going to want to do the opposite aren't you you want to you want to get out of there so I think actually demonstrating it's okay to be different really genuinely being curious giving people the space to speak share give feedback like you said and and acknowledge that they're being listened to that their contribution is valid I think that's really really important and for many of us we adopt teams when we take on these roles we don't we don't build things from scratch you know it's if we ever get that opportunity it's an amazing one and it's exciting and you're in full control of it and you'll be able to really um, hold yourself to account around building diversity if you're able to do it literally from day one but that's not realistic in every circumstance often we adopt teams but that doesn't mean that we can't evolve that team over time like the example you shared Susie you had a predominantly male team an opportunity came up that you created to to add a role and to expand and your your view was I need to add another gender into this I need something different I need different skill set you know you thought about that that was something you drove but I think that's much more of the common scenario that we find ourselves in so it's definitely a great example of saying you don't just have to accept what you've got you still have the power if you're a leader to to make changes to evolve the teams that you lead and and to ensure that actually they're set up in the way that you want to achieve more success using different varied skill sets yeah absolutely I think that piece there's two pieces you mentioned there that I want to kind of pick up on so first is about that intention so being intentional mm. about how you move forward and thinking about the set setup of that team and how it can help you um add more value so you know looking for okay what's perhaps missing in this team and how can I fill that gap in order to add more value back into the Mm. business or to the organization and also to the people as well in in this kind of immediate environment the other thing I want to pick up there is about the role modeling aspect because we've talked a little bit about role modeling before I just want to kind of pick that apart so to speak because some of you might be there thinking well it's all very good saying that but how do you actually role model what does that actually Mm. look like in reality and that can be as simple in this case of how you welcome someone to the business, to the team, yeah, in terms of are you treating everybody the same in terms of that induction, that introduction? Are you being intentional in the way that you listen uh, and not express or have some of those judgments, which we all do, we all have? Um, You know, it's about being, you know, intentional in the way that we ask and seek for different opinions and really listening to what those are and the value that that can then generate in terms of whether you're solving a problem, in terms of um, the way that you're perhaps communicating, et cetera, et cetera. So that role modeling piece is actually a really simple thing that you can start to do because behavior breeds behavior and people will see that And they'll start connecting the dots and thinking, okay, that's how I need to behave. That's how we do things around here. And it Mm. snowballs and it builds and it goes from there. And so that is a really critical element, in my opinion, around how you build a diverse team. Mm. I think as well into that role modelling piece, it's not just about doing as you say, 
which I think is a big part of it. I think it's challenging when you don't see it. Yes. So, you know, it's being bold enough to say, well, this is what I stand for. This is what I represent. So this is how I'm going to be. But actually then if you're seeing the opposite from others or in the way the organization is acting, behaving, things they're setting up is challenging and calling that out. Yeah. Definitely something that's slightly harder to do, but I think it's necessary because I think that way you really are embodying everything that you're, you know, that you stand for. And you're not just Mm -hmm. saying, well, because I'm doing it, it's fine, but I'm just going to ignore and turn a blind eye to things I don't like. Um, so I think challenging is also partly about the the role model piece as well. So I think we talked a bit about the, um, I mean, I'm, I mentioned in the introduction, when we talk about diversity, there's so many different forms of diversity and they come in so many different shapes and sizes and the way in which a team is constructed can involve all of those things. I know one of the areas that you and I are the most probably familiar with, in all honesty, is is around the skill sets form of diversity and really supporting and encouraging a team with mixed skills, which in the organisation you and I both worked at, that really started to become an area that was being strongly advocated and with the use of personality profiling tools, which you and I are both accredited DISC practitioners. So that's something we've got more experience of. What what would you say are the benefits of taking that approach around the skill sets piece? And how have you found that to be really useful in creating diverse teams? I mean, where do I start? <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> um, in all honesty, <clears throat> it is something which, as you mentioned, we're both very passionate about. That's why we trained to do it, but also that I've probably seen no disadvantage of in terms of um, knowing that about each individual in the team. So the way we used certainly personality profiling when Lisa and I worked together was that everybody did their individual uh, personality profiling report. Um, It was analyzed on an individual basis and, and, and kind of deep dived into with that individual in terms of some of the things they're great at, some of the watch out, some of the ways around communication and problem solving, how they may react under pressure. Um, so that builds, first of all, the individual self-knowing. And so that means that they have better self-awareness of themselves. It makes them more in tune with their um, EQ. We've talked about EQ before, emotional intelligence mm-hmm. on this podcast. But how you then layer that up in terms of diversity for a team is that it gives you an understanding. It's my point really at the start of our discussion around where your strengths lie in that team. So if a lot of people in that team have um, a preference around being detail orientated, being quite cautious, being very number data driven, and you have 90 percent of your team that sit with some of those preferences and characteristics and nobody perhaps on the other side, who are more around being people focused, outgoing, I'm generalizing here to make a point. Yeah. But, you know, it it starts to then show where there is um, some great strengths that can be utilized, but also where there are some opportunities to do some different things and and perhaps kind of bring in some, some different skill sets, as you've mentioned. And my experience of bringing in those different skill sets is firstly, by doing that, it really celebrates who that person is and what they bring. So I was quite avert in saying, like, I'm really interested in this particular area of your skill set. And that's why I think you would be great in this role. Or you bring this into the team. And I really um, think that's an area that everybody could learn from you. So I'm quite avert in my communication around Mm -hmm. some of that. And I have found that that hasn't necessarily had many disadvantages, because people then feel quite Um, fulfilled that we are celebrating who they are what they bring Um, and it's less about the actual functional job role and the functional piece it's more about them as a person and what they kind of yeah bring to the situation and and I think if you're on the other end of that and I can't necessarily speak from experience I'm not sure this actually ever happened to me but I imagine um, it's that you then feel that this person kind of believes in me, actually cares about me as a person, as a, in, in my entirety and the value that I add. 
rather than being somebody who fills a gap in terms of the functional remit of this yeah. team because I have a skill set which is really important and can add value here does that make sense yeah it makes perfect sense and I think the way I would summarize it is it actually enables in the way that you've described it and I like how you say you know it's been really overt around it is that you're in my opinion the way I've interpreted that is it sounds like you're saying I see you like I you know and you feel seen and and I know you said that you haven't personally been a recipient of that but I can vouch that I've been a recipient of it from yourself and that you I can absolutely confirm that you are avert around the way that you approach it because that is how you approached it with me when we were looking at the possibility of me joining your team and and taking that opportunity because actually the way you approached it with me was very much around leading with you have a skill set that I'm really interested in um you know you're passionate about coaching and people development and I think it would be uh, a great value add to the team that I already have and you know you bring your experience with um you know leading a team like very much the language you used with me made me feel seen and as though you understood what was important to me and what I was passionate about which encouraged me to want to join in your team even more and gave me that sense of I could belong here because there is a space that fits me um and so I can absolutely vouch that that worked in that way and that your approach really did give that sense and I think it's so important because you want to feel like you're fulfilling a space and it, that is one that you absolutely can fill. You don't want to be a round pig in a square hole, which I definitely have been in the past. And I know we've spoken about it in other episodes where I've really genuinely, I've taken on a challenging role, but it was because I've always had this desire to challenge and push myself, stretch myself. But it hasn't always worked out because whether it's you know and I take some responsibility for this it's often not worked out where I just haven't felt do you know what I fit here it is utilizing my skill set I am being celebrated I am being I am being supported so it definitely you know it is it is so important to feel that actually the space you're filling is the right space for you and that you absolutely can fill it. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I know, you know, historically, I think this is definitely true when I started out as, as a manager, you know, differences in others around skill set specifically, I'm referring to, I'm not referring to anything else as part of this conversation, but specifically skill sets. I was always attracted to those who had similar skill sets to my own. And I think that is a natural human instinct that you are attracted to sameness. And, and, you know, I think it's probably the source of the majority of a lot of the problems we have across the whole globe. I'm not going deep in this today. <laughs> I, this, I, I'm going to be totally out <laughs> this of This could be a whole other episode. Knowledge. Yeah, quite. But that is a fact. As human beings, we're attracted to sameness and we find comfort in similarity. We do. And we build connections through similarities. So that's natural. I think it's being aware of that and challenging it in ourselves because I know as a young manager those would be the people that I would gravitate to those would be the people I'd want to build a team from those would be the people I would want to celebrate but actually that wasn't helpful it wasn't helpful to me and it wasn't helpful it was being extremely dismissive to those who were different you know I'm an extroverted character and I've always struggled with introverts but actually over time I've learned to adjust my approach be flexible be much more inclusive, be much more respectful of that preference and style and look at how I can encourage and, you know, bring into those uh, those individuals, into conversations, into my team. And actually, you know, over time, I've built teams with a much more varied you know, preference of, of character and style to great benefit to both myself and to them because they have different skill sets to my own. And that's a good thing. It means that I've been able to achieve a hell of a lot more, but I think it's, it's knowing and being aware of that and then challenging it when it's happening and challenging it when it's happening in ourselves, because that's the only way that I think you can really encourage diversity. 
So how do we think businesses can attract more, more of a diverse workforce when they are in that recruitment stage so that actually they really ensure that the outcome of the recruitment process is building diverse workforces? So I think, firstly, thinking actually quite practically. So mm. let's say, for example, you've um, got a gap in your team. So whether that's a, a role that's already been existing, somebody's moved on, you need to fill that role, or it's a brand new role that's been created and you need to get somebody in. But if you've got kind of a, a recruitment opportunity within um, your team, think quite practically in two ways. So firstly, actually, who is the panel that are going to be recruiting for that role? And how diverse is that panel of people? And yes. that can come down to diverse in terms of their skill set. So mm-hmm. the things that they value and um, bring and, and are good at, but also um, looking for their uniqueness as well and not kind of um, downplaying that in the recruitment process so that you really put value against everything that that person brings and kind of reduce bias as much as possible in that decision making process that it doesn't just come down to one person's opinion which is the manager actually that there is a couple of people in that process involved who have diversity of thought uh, and can bring you know some different perspectives into that decision making process so that would be my first kind of tip is that actually Mm -hmm. thinking about who is involved in that process and also looking for the criteria that you evaluate against if you get more of the same skills that are already in your team you'll get more of the same results so you need to really this again is about being intentional just stop and think about actually where are we now where are we trying to get to what are we trying to achieve and what's the gap and actually that gap piece is really looking at perhaps then what's the opportunity here in terms of who I bring into this team now to help us get to where we want to be. And so looking at the criteria you use and what you're evaluating against in order to measure success in that recruitment process is really, really critical. And, you know, have you got some skills in there which you're looking for, which perhaps don't already exist in your team? Um, If you don't, okay, there may be a reason for that, but maybe just um intentionally question yourself and think actually is that right is Mm. that the right thing to be doing so I think intentional um an intentional approach on this is quite a critical piece thinking about how you recruit successfully in Mm. creating a more diverse team yeah absolutely and I think to build on that I think it's thinking about what is the language you're using in your advertising so you know if you're going to use more masculine dominant language that could be quite segregational and that you'll only then attract potentially more males or you may attract um more certain sort of very controlled directive dominant types so I think having a real variation of language in your advert is really important I think also thinking about where do you promote your roles and potentially who with so when you're thinking about recruiters if you're going to use a recruitment agent I think you have to really align around um, diversity and understand actually what's their approach to ensure that more diverse applicants are coming through and I think also thinking about where you promote so and how varied you make that you know, because I think LinkedIn is a great place to promote roles because there are so many people on LinkedIn, so many people looking at it from a job search perspective all over the world as well. So I think that is an example of a platform where you will get a really great mix of people. I, th- I think it's thinking about any, are there any others? And I think lastly, it's, you know, touching upon what we've already talked about. We talk, We have talked about the insightful power of personality tools actually utilizing personality profiling during the process so actually as part of the application process you have individuals complete their own assessment and actually that gives you such more you get such a high level of detail and of all you know such a variation of levels um 
to help contribute to that person's application it goes alongside their interview their cv etc you you get a much more in-depth view of who that person is and what they're about yeah and I would definitely just kind of build off that as using those tools as supportive tools yeah I wouldn't use we wouldn't we're not advocating using them as um decision making tools no. I think they are absolutely supportive tools as Lisa's mentioned to go alongside the other steps of well your recruitment process um yeah because <clears throat> we're not again we're not about putting people in boxes here that's not what we're saying but it is gives you a deeper level of understanding around their personality and so then what their strengths are and what that can bring to your current setup but also what some of the kind of opportunity areas are as well yeah totally yeah thanks for thanks for stating that clearly absolutely it's it's more information that's all it is so Diversity has its benefits, which we've talked about, but it can obviously bring some challenges naturally because of the conflicts created from people's differences. So how do you address sort of inter-team conflicts when these occur? Yeah, I mean, let's be real about it. Inter-team conflicts happen a lot, in my experience. (laughs) Um, And it's, you know, it, it is quite rare that everybody gets on all the time, you know, doesn't have a disagreement doesn't have a a difference of opinion um and that's good that's healthy but it does happen and it's about um in my experience it mainly happens because people are either not seeking to understand why that person has a different viewpoint and they're not fully seeking to understand they're kind of like yeah tell me okay yeah but this is why you're wrong because I think this and that then leads to people feeling that they're not being listened to properly they're not being heard Um, And then it escalates and the connection gets lost. The trust starts to become eroded. um, The understanding goes and then that equals conflict. And that's kind of why we end up in that kind of stage of of conflict quite often. Um, And I think I find, you know, the the examples where I think about the times I've had been involved in kind of team conflict, so to speak. That sounds really aggressive, team conflict. We've had a, a, you know, perhaps a a difference of opinion or a misunderstanding has been because I have come at something from a perspective that is polar opposite to what the other person has come at. And we probably haven't given each other the opportunity to fully explain why each other feels and thinks the way that they do and Mm. I have found those more extreme opposites linked to my personality probably in the way that I value things in the way that my preferences kind of um are in terms of the way I communicate etc have been the, the other person's had completely polar opposites to me and so I find people who are extremely opposite to me the most challenging to kind of build connection with and get on with because there's something in me that I kind of think oh I don't understand them and that's probably my fault because I haven't created the opportunity to fully understand them um and so that's when conflicts you know occur and I think in order to address it in a team there's a there's a part there around actually just kind of pausing and taking it back a step and actually saying okay can you tell me more about why you think that or why you think that's the right solution or what why your viewpoint is this on this particular problem or whatever it is take it back a step try and explore it try and fully understand it seek to understand properly before you move on to try and solve it and get to a solution Mm. that would be my kind of top tip in terms of addressing some of that team conflict based on my experiences yeah and I think it's encouraging always open dialogue I think conflict go unresolved they escalate when conversations stop and communication ends so I think it's always encouraging that open conversation and you know just saying it's okay to disagree like you don't have to agree on everything um it's about sometimes it's that age-old saying you know it's okay to you know you'd have to agree to disagree and I think what's always worked for me in the past is just ensuring that everyone is accepting of the fact that they're going to have to align at some point it's not about agreeing it's just about accepting aligning ensuring there's a way forward I think when you know as a leader of 
teams I think when there's been conflicts that I can see are going on for too long they're escalating I think that's where as a leader you have to intervene and actually facilitate a conversation between the two people and say look it's something clearly is not working here I've seen it give them that feedback and then hold a safe space for them to be able to work it through and encourage each one of them to speak and to allow each other to speak and to be listened to without interruption so that actually you can air out what's going on you can get all the elephants out you can give both parties an opportunity to say their piece be listened to to then try and then get that moment of you know let's let's just call it let's call a peace deal and see if we can move forward but I think it's always like with everything I think I always start with calling out look this is okay like it's normal it's it's not a bad thing what's bad is if we let this stew and stay stuck and don't don't continue to move forwards and accept the differences and, and find a way to work together well, it's the same in our personal lives, isn't it, as well? We have times where we are in conflict or we, we come at things from a very different perspective with perhaps your partner, with friends, with family. Um, you know, it's it's very much part of our everyday at work and, and in our personal lives as well. Um, but I think, you know, again, if you're intentional about calling it and about thinking about how are we going to resolve this to move forward in the best possible way, um, then I don't think you can go far wrong. No. And I think look, it's about accepting differences and that differences are fine. They're OK. I think the biggest problem we have always when it comes to tackling issues around diversity is that simple point. It's just actually being different is OK. It's fine. Not being all the same is fine. Actually, being all the same is dangerous. That makes us robots. And who wants to live in a world like that? It's now time for this week's Workplace Shame Story. This is where we share an embarrassing workplace story from one of our listeners, our CBBs, or from one of us, if we're feeling brave, which we are today, because Lisa yep. is going to share a workplace shame today. Yep. So I'm up, I'm up again. It's another workplace shame story <laughs> from me. So this was, God, this was a few years ago now. I think I'd only been working at this company for a couple of months. It couldn't have been much longer than that. And you know what it's like in those early days when you start a new job, you make an effort with your wardrobe. Well, I always oh, did. It, yeah. kind of, it kind of tails off over time. You know, I start <laughs> I start making an effort and then by the end of it, I'm pretty much oh, going into work in my joggers. In full glam. And then it yeah, just exactly. kind of escalates. Peter's out. Yeah. It peter's out. So I'd started this job. I've been there a couple of months. We used to sit in these big open plan offices on banks of desks yeah and I had decided to uh, wear heels that day now anyone who knows me well who's worked for me knows I don't wear heels to work I don't really wear heels at all so this was clearly in those early days the green days when I was feeling you know everything was new <laughs> it was like a start of a new relationship so I was making an effort I was dressing up so I was wearing trousers and these heels and I was um, sitting at my desk cracking on with the day and we used to sit quite closely to each other so I would be in a line of I think there's about five people on each bank like five people on each side of a bank of desks so you would literally have you know a bank with 10 people on facing each other then you'd have another bank 10 people facing into each other so you would always have your back to um, a line as well and anyway I, I got up out of my chair um on one of these said banks of desks and went to get up and I think I was going off to go to the coffee machine to get a coffee and did not realize that I had stepped one heel of one shoe into the shoe of the other foot so I literally stepped into my shoes and got my feet tangled and as I got up and started to walk away stepped into the shoe and literally tied my feet together and had I I mean I didn't really know what to do so I ended up literally just falling forward like um a tree being felled it was like timber (laughs) she's going down and I mean I had no way of stopping my feet from doing this because they were so tangled up with with one another 
and I literally just went down like a sack of spuds right in the middle of oh, um, no. the sort of the walkway between these two banks of desks and the sound it made I mean it was like an almighty thud and everyone was <laughs> like <gasps> and like jumped up to like see if I was all right or well and to also see what happened because it was this big open plan office so the whole office heard it and were looking around and I was just lying flat on my face like laughing you know with absolute embarrassment at the, the, the fact this has happened um and I still couldn't get up because my feet were still tangled together because this one heel of my right foot was still in the shoe of the left I mean it was kind of I can't of. even visualize so, yes. that like so you've got one foot and then literally like like yeah like stuck yeah. Like, I managed to I managed to catch the heel of the right foot I think it was it might have been the left other way around but anyway the right heel went into the back of the shoe of the of the left foot I literally stepped into it. I mean, got, you know, that is a one-off, the chances, isn't it? In terms of, yeah. The chances. If, and you've never worn a high heel again. <laughs> Hardly, no. Not in, not in a workplace, no. I think I gave oh, up after that. That is pretty shameful, I'll be honest. That, But it's a great story. It is a <laughs> great story. Oh, my goodness. I'd be mortified. And that's, like, something that would happen to me, like, for sure. I would absolutely do something like that. So, so yeah. So, so there oh, you are, CBBs. You. Another cracker from me. So if one of you have a workplace shame that you're keen to get off your chest and have featured in this season, you can email it to us at hello at thecoachingcast.co.uk or you can message us on Instagram by searching for at the coaching cast. But don't worry, unlike Susie and I, where we clearly come clean and we share our stories for you all to laugh at, knowing full well that you're laughing at us, your shame stories will be anonymous. It's now time for Bullshit Bingo, where we call out phrases which get commonly used in the workplace, which make us cringe. Cringe. Today's, yeah, today's bullshit bingo is I will circle around in a bit, or alternatively, let's circle back to that. <laughs> what do you think, Susie? This is really American, by the way. I I see this a lot in American things. I like it. I will circle around in a bit, or let's circle back to that. I would so if I do, I don't think I've used this, but if I would use this, I'd have to like do like a a motion of a circle like with my arm I'd be like let's circle around in about probably I'd probably do, do the head as well like it'd be like a full top body action like let's fully circle but then I'd look a bit like I was doing an exercise class like whoa let's circle around <laughs> um yeah I don't think I've used this one I've heard it for sure um it's quite a common one I think uh, mm. circling back round um kind of get the objective like we'll come back to it um, I just say you come back to it we'll come back to that but I think it's one of these and we've had a few of these haven't we on the um kind of podcast so far where they overcomplicate what they're actually meant to mean this is one of yeah. them this is an overcomplication one I see and hear this a lot on American sort of shows or social pages circling circling back Maybe they're just all said, circling around and like together. And it you know, just sounds very complicated. Yeah. We'll just come back to that. Circling around suggests that you're going on a massive long journey and you're going to be touching on loads of different things. I wouldn't be confident if they said we're going to circle back to that. I'd be like, when? When does this circle end? Well, when How they're on a hike, the they're circling around on their hikes, as Good we point. discussed. Yeah. You know, love a hike. So, yeah, I think that's where it comes from, personally. Um, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> So yeah, so CBBs, if you've got a bullshit bingo that you, we haven't featured on the coaching cast yet that you would love to share with us, please, please, please do so. We do love receiving them. Uh, you can email them to us at hello at thecoachingcast.co.uk. Please send them through. We love them. So we are coming to the end of today's episode where we have continued our discussions around inclusivity by talking about how to build a diverse team. So this is clearly a big subject. We've shared our thoughts and suggestions on this today. And here they are. These are our top tips from what we've discussed around diversity. So number one is seek to understand 
and be curious in your approach. So really ensure that you understand all the individuals in your team, that you are taking the time and the consideration to get to know them, understand, learn all about them, and really ensure that actually you are supporting that connection and enabling them to fill apart that team by being listened to. Number two is be intentional in creating a diverse team and a team which encourages belonging for individuals. So really being intentional and celebrating that differences are good. It's okay to be different. It's boring if we're all the same. And that actually those differences really add a huge amount of value to a team and enable them to be more successful. And the third point is really looking at your enablers for growing diversity in your team. So review your operational policies that includes your recruitment, thinking about actually, do you even have a policy around diversity? Do you need one? If you do review it, is it still relevant? And really think about even engagement surveys. So again, coming to that point we've said about seeking to understand people, seeking to be intentional and creating belonging, actually people being listened to, heard is so important to uh, achieve that. So think about surveys around engaging individuals and getting their feedback. And the fourth thing, because we've got a fourth tip on this critical subject is be aware of your bias. So we all have bias. It's a part of us. It's based on how we've been brought up, our experiences, the way we've lived, our socioeconomic backgrounds, our ethnicity. It exists. It's not about stopping it. That's impossible. It's just being about being aware of it and always checking in on your bias when you're making decisions around people. And the one thing we haven't put on there, which we should, because Susie and I are huge advocates of it, is utilize personality profiling tools. They're so, so helpful. But remember, they're there to give you more information. They're not there to create decisions. So the one that Susie and I advocate is DISC. If you want to learn more, you can drop us a message. We'll tell you all about it. Others, yeah. <laughs> others are available though. Others are available. So questions to ask yourself to support you this week on this really important subject is number one, what does diversity mean to me? Number two, what changes can I make to embrace more diversity in my team? And number three, what support do I require to make this happen and who can help me? don't worry if you can't remember all of these all of our top tips and recommendations will be on our instagram page at the coaching cast this week we hope you've enjoyed today and have some new ideas to take away and try for yourselves if you have any questions thoughts or feedback we love hearing from you and you can contact us in three ways so hello at the coachingcast.co.uk so drop us an email you can contact us on instagram at the coaching cast and we also have a brand new website the coachingcast.co.uk where you can get in touch and also sign up for updates and exclusive content Your support means everything. Therefore, if you like what you've heard today and would like to help us grow this podcast, please do us a favour. Follow us on Instagram, leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app and subscribe to future episodes wherever you listen. Don't forget, you can also watch each episode on our YouTube channel by searching for The Coaching Cast, where you can also subscribe to be notified when new episodes are released. In next week's episode, we have another of our special guests joining us. Ex-Olympian Jack Green will be coming onto the coaching cast to share his thoughts and ideas with us on how to manage well-being more effectively in work, sharing his experiences from the world of elite sport. So that's going to be a really interesting one. We haven't talked about sport yet on um, the coaching cast, so definitely uh, an episode which is going to be a bit different. Mm, very excited we both love music and use it to motivate and energize us so we like to finish each episode with our personal song recommendation giving you positivity and energy as you launch into your next meeting activity whatever you're doing today so it's my choice this week and I've chosen Cold Heart which is the PNAU remix featuring Dua Lipa and Elton John so I absolutely love this Elton John it's track. Great. I actually think so, this remix is really good. Yeah, it's I good. I think it's a banger. So I'm going to stick that on as soon as we finish this, I think. So, yes, thanks for listening this week. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. It's brilliant to have you all on board, CBBs. And it means a huge amount to Susie and I that you're here. Have a great week. And remember, you've got this. Mm-hmm.